how can we best support our children in sports? Without a doubt, we have a lot of parents who are investing in their children, doing everything they can to support their child's career. And yet, is that what we should be doing as parents? We've got a lot of parents who are really focused on their kids enjoying their sport, having fun, and being happy. Is that the best approach? Probably not. Today, we've got an expert in children's moral and emotional development from Harvard Graduate School of Education. His work focuses on moral development, the nature of hope, vulnerability and resilience in childhood, parenting and effective schools, and services for children. He's the author of the powerful book, The Parents We Mean to Be, which we've actually discussed this book on the podcast before, and we're excited in the next two episodes to talk about how we can be better as sports parents. Welcome to the Coaching Culture Podcast. I'm your host, J.P. Nurbin, and I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Nate Sanderson. The mission of this podcast is to help you become a better leader and build a better culture. In addition to this podcast, I'm the founder of TOC, which provides one-on-one coaching and consulting for leaders. Learn more about us at tocculture.com. This episode is brought to you by the TOC Newsletter. Every Thursday, our newsletter includes two things you don't want to miss out on. Firstly, the notes to that week's podcast episode. Whether you're listening while driving the car, out for a run, or doing the dishes, we don't want you to miss the biggest takeaways from each episode. Secondly, each newsletter is a short article from myself or Nate on leadership and culture. These articles are designed to inspire, encourage, and provide practical insights into leadership and culture building. Our content is a perfect fit for anyone who wants to stay up to date with the latest trends and insights in culture building. You can subscribe to the newsletter at tocculture.com or by clicking on the link in the details of each episode. Well, Rick, we're excited to have you on the podcast here today. We don't hardly ever do this in terms of uh, reading anything from anyone's bio, but there's a sentence in there that I think just helps our audience And as we mentioned kind of before we got on here, that our audience is mostly high school and college coaches, just to give them a little background to kind of set up our first question here, that there's a sentence that says your work focuses on moral development, the nature of hope, vulnerability and resilience in childhood, parenting and effective schools and services for children. We think about all of that, of all the things that you could have done with your life, what is it that drew you into this field in particular that you've become so passionate about? Uh, you know, it's a great question. There, there are, there are a number of different things and, you know, those are a number of different areas that I've been working on. Um, so they, they all have a little bit different origins, but, you know, in a way, my North star has always been, is always been justice. How do we create a more just world? And a lot of the work I do with schools and with services is about leveling the playing field for low income kids, kids who have faced disadvantaged, disadvantages. A lot of the moral development work is about how do you cultivate in young people a commitment to justice and clarity about what justice is. Um, How do you get people, a lot of the work is about how do you get people to think beyond themselves about people who are different from them and to care about people who are different from them in class and race and culture and gender and ethnicity and a lot of other things. So those are some of the threads that, that that connect the work. And I'm curious if there was any life experience along the, the path that really helped steer you towards this, like what really made you lock in on this um, when it came to your journey? Well, you know, in terms of moral development, there are a couple of things. One is that, you know, in my household, I think in my home growing up, this is sort of what we lived and breathed. You know, there was a sense in my family that we had commitments to other people. We had commitments to the common good and that we did not live in a fair or just world and that we had some obligation to try and redress the injustices in the world. Um, So that was very much part of the fabric of my growing up. My father was also a real estate developer who became interested in moral development. So by the time I was around 10 years old, he started giving me moral dilemmas and sort of engaging me in moral questions. And, you know, and my friends too. And that might sound really nerdy, and it was pretty nerdy. But it was also really fun. You know, there, these were really interesting questions. And, you know, kids from a young age like to think about tough moral questions. They, they deal with them all the time. You know, if I want to invite someone to my birthday party, but my best friend doesn't like her, should I invite her anyway? I mean, there are all these moral dilemmas in kids' lives. And 
my dad would give me dilemmas that were related to things that were going on in my life. And, um, you know, I played a lot of sports too. And there, as you know, as you both know, a lot of moral dilemmas in sports. So that was also sort of fruitful territory for talking about moral questions and moral dilemmas. Yeah, I love this. Uh, you know, and really, I think one of the big themes that we hear a lot in sports lately um, is character. You know, we want players with character. We want to develop players with character. And this podcast is, is for coaches. Yet I think one of the things that often happens for us as coaches is we get so caught up in our players that we oftentimes forget probably our greatest responsibility, which is our own kids, right? We're so caught up in helping other people's kids. We, we oftentimes sometimes neglect. And when I read your book, it really was almost a call to action to, hey, make sure whatever you do, that this is something you don't forget. And I think one of the big themes that just jumps out right off the bat uh, in your in your book back from 2009, The Parents Were Meant to Be, is just how we cannot neglect this responsibility. And so often, I think in society, people are expecting the character or the moral development of their kids to happen in the schools, that happen by their coaches. When it's, you know, even from your own personal experience with your own father, that's where it starts. So I was just hoping you could speak to, to that. Just speak to the importance of how important the home is and the parents are for the development of the individual. So I, I think without question, the primary influence on kids' moral development are parents. Um, you know, peers certainly also have an influence. The kind of things you do on social media can have an influence. Um, things that are going on in the broader culture can have an influence. But what parents are modeling day to day and how parents interact day to day with their kids that's what really primarily defines moral development. And, and there's a huge amount of literature, a mountain of literature that supports that, that whether kids develop empathy, whether they develop a commitment to fairness, um, whether or not they're able to manage destructive feelings, shame, anger, frustration, intense competitive feelings in ways that are constructive and don't hurt other people, parents exert enormous amount of influence over those things. So sport coaches can influence kids for sure, teachers for sure, a lot of other people. But at, at core, it's parents. And I think that if we don't change parenting practices in this country, we're not going to get very far in raising more kids who are really good moral people good, and good people and moral people in the broader sense of the word. I want to ask you this question. So... I have this book of questions. Uh, well, it's a book called Questions for My Father that sits in the back seat of our car. When I drive my kids around, sometimes my 10-year-old will pull it out and ask me these random questions. And one of the questions in the book is, Dad, what do you hope for me in my future? And when I think about that question, so often I think parents say, I just want you to be happy and healthy. And sometimes, you know, our, our society is so driven toward, and especially parenting today, trying to ensure that our kids are happy all the time. I feel like as I thought about answering that question for Adelaide, that there's got to be more than that, right? Like as a parent, I hope for something more than you just being happy. I don't know that she really understood what I was talking about. But when you hear that phrase, you know, parents are just, they're just grinding, trying to make sure that their kids are happy all the time. What are we missing in that pursuit? So, I think the most important thing we can do as parents is raise moral kids. And, and the reflex that parents have to say to their kids, the most important thing to me is that you're happy. I think we should really check. We should really work to curb that reflex. I think we should say, the most important th thing to me is that you're a caring, good person who's going to contribute to the common good. I also, of course, care about you being happy. But we will not survive as a society if we keep focusing on this hyper-individualism, it's not just about your happiness. It's about what you contribute to other people. And I feel like we've gone down a really dangerous road with this focus on happiness and achievement. And our data shows us very clearly that if you ask kids what's most important to their parents, they tend to rank happiness first, achievement second, and being a caring person third. You know, put another way, about 80% of kids are identifying some aspect of their individual well-being, achievement or happiness is more important than caring for other people. And if you want to know why we have so many problems in the country right now, that is one of the sources that we really haven't 
underscored as parents, as, as our ancestors did, the importance of being a moral person, the importance of being a good citizen. And so, of course, I want people to be happy, but we got to get back to putting front and center being a good person, being a moral person, being a person who cares about justice. Um, the other thing I was going to say, and I think this is to your to your point, Nate, is that a lot of the things that we do to promote our kids' happiness, I don't think are even making them happier. You know, when we swoop in to resolve minor peer conflicts they're having, we are depriving them of coping strategies that are going to be very important for them. You know, the kind of allergy to adversity that a lot of parents have these days, in middle and upper class communities especially, I think to robs kids of coping strategies that can be very important to them. When we're asking kids about their, you know, it's really important to get kids to identify and articulate their feelings. But when we're asking kids about their moods every 10 minutes, does that make you frustrated? Does that make you sad? Does that make you angry? I worry about that too. It can get kids to be hyper focused on their own feelings, you know, to turn their own inner lives into theater. And that we would be better to get those kids to focus on how other kids are feeling, you know, in the playground. Um, and again, I think it's really important to focus on how your kids are feeling, but also to get them focused on how other kids are feeling. Because if you do that, they're going to have better relationships their whole lives. They're going to be better friends. They're going to be better romantic partners. They're going to be better parents. And those are the important sources of happiness. So my point is that in the service of trying to protect our kids' moment-to-moment -moment happiness, we're often doing things that I think are, in fact, undermining their long-term well-being or happiness. Do you see that as something that is unique to American culture? Or, I mean, I, I read some of Phil Jackson's work, and he talks about the influence of Native American culture on his coaching philosophy and, you know, talking about the tribe and the circle and, and all those things that you're describing there. Is this something that's become an American phenomenon, or is it more widespread than that? So I think it's a great question. I, you know, I would say, and I'm speaking very broadly here, that it's not even an American phenomenon in the sense that many immigrant families in this country are not hyper-focused on the individual, are much more focused on the collective. There's a long history in African-American communities of focusing on the collective. A lot of what I'm talking about here is much more a white, middle, and upper class phenomenon in this country. And I think it's true in other European countries as well. And I'm not an expert on all the European countries, but that's what I understand is some of the Western industrialized countries, you see the same some of the same parenting trends, but this, this focus on happiness and achievement. Um, so it's a very important question. And the answer is, I think it varies quite a lot across race, ethnicity, and country. I know one of the things that after reading the book, uh, I stopped doing was asking my daughter and my son after every practicing game, did you have fun today? Like, just like, as if that was like, whether it was a success or not. I mean, obviously we want them to have fun. They're young, they're seven, they're six, but like, I feel like that question almost irritates them at some point, you know, we're constantly expecting them to have fun. And some days it's, it's not going to be fun. It doesn't mean it wasn't worth going. So I appreciate your perspective on that. Another, another thing I think that really has stuck with me with the book, and I've really wanted to ask you about, I mean, there's obviously been a lot of, and we talk on this podcast a lot about, you know, praise versus affirmation and how we can be praise junkies. You know, we just constantly good job, good job with our kids. And we, really try to focus more on affirmation, which talks about the specific behavior, you know, that led to it. But there's something you said that was really profound. You said the self becomes stronger and more mature, less by being praised than by being known. Less by being praised than by being known. Can you talk a little about what, what is that? What's the difference between praise and, and really being known? Well, I think what we all want in a very deep level is for people to know who we are and appreciate us for those qualities that we value in ourselves. And, you know, from infancy, you, you know, I think the best parents are the parents that are getting to know who their infants are and are trying to appreciate who their infants are and help them realize their abilities. Um, and, you know, praise is more complicated. If, you know, if you praise kids, based on something they really value in themselves, um, occasionally, that can be very meaningful. But a lot of kids are getting praised just around performance. It's not really about who they are. It's about um, whether they 
perform well on a certain task. And my beef about praising, and, and JB, you sort of alluded to this, is I think, you know, occasional praise and a praise around things that are specific can be very important. I think when you say to kids all the time, you're special or you're wonderful, it's just not meaningful. It's not specific enough. And it doesn't really reflect knowing them in a deep way. I mean, I think what's much more important is if you're able to say to kids, you know, I've noticed over the last month, you've been really kind to a lot of people, or you've really gone out of your way for a lot of people. Or, you know, I've noticed that you're the kind of person that really gets a lot of joy from other people's joy. I mean, those are forms of praise that are really important. I mean, if they're accurate, if they're accurately reflecting qualities that kids really care about in themselves. Yeah, I, I'm going to share a real proud parenting moment today. And this does not happen every day, but we were at the, we were just having dinner uh, a few hours ago. And my daughter said she had a new kid come to school and the girl was from Germany. And I said, oh, that's really interesting. I said, you know, how did it go? You know, did you get to meet her? And she says, yeah, I, I, we talked, I got to meet her. And I, I asked her how she felt coming to a new school from a different country. And she said, you know, talked a little bit. I was just scary and stuff. And she says, it's okay. I know exactly what it feels like to have come, you know, because she moved from America to Ireland, you know, just a couple of years ago. So I was just so, so proud of her in that moment. And I felt like that was the moment to praise. It's just like, I love the way that you just showed that you cared about her and you put yourself in her shoes. I, that was, that was pretty powerful. Great moment. Great moment. And, and, a, and a great thing to affirm, you know, to use your word or, or to praise. Um, but that's really different than a lot of ways praise is used, which is often to sort of regulate their behavior. Like, you know, when my kids were young, sometimes one of them would clear, the, clear their plate or put a dish in the sink and they would say, Dad, I, you know, I cleared my plate and I would be like, you think you're Cinderella? Do you want a trophy? I mean, um, you're not going to get praise for doing things that we expect you to do around the house. I mean, that's where that's another way in which praising gets to be too much. Um, those are things that should become habits. They're reflexes. They're things that we should live and breathe all the time. To praise your daughter for going out of the way for somebody else, that is something you should praise. And it does re reflect a really positive quality in your daughter that I think you want to reinforce. This episode is brought to you by the Culture System Online Training Platform. It's the ultimate resource for coaches who want to become more transformational and build winning team cultures. Whether you're just starting out or looking to take your coaching to the next level, our one of a kind online training platform is designed to help you learn the culture system framework at your own pace. Through this course, I'll share with you the proven methods, tools, and strategies used by some of the best teams and organizations in the world. You'll get access to customizable digital tools and a group chat to engage with experienced coaches and apply the four-part framework throughout your season. With the culture system online training, you'll be inspired and transformed through the stories and lessons of real leaders who've successfully applied these methods and tools within their organizations. You'll gain a deeper commitment to transformational coaching and be equipped with the tools and strategies you need to build a great team culture. To get access to this course today, simply go to tocculture.com and click on the online course tab or click on the link provided in the details of this episode. Don't miss this opportunity to become a more transformational coach and take your team to the next level with the Culture System online training platform. Let me ask you this question because, again, we're, we, you mentioned the word performance there, and a lot of our audience here is, is coaches whose job is to get children, you know, kids to perform in their sport. Teachers, their job is to get students to perform in their subject. So what advice would you give to us that are in the performance industry, so to speak, but at the same time are looking to have a positive impact on the kids and the players that we're working with? How are we able to sort of walk that line between trying to help those individuals be known, as you talked about, that they can build that strength, but also there is a responsibility here where performance does matter in a sense. Well, you know, I think when we, we, we use the word character, and I think JP used the word character, it, it might help just to stop, pause for a minute and talk about character and the different domains of character in my mind. And, I, you know, I'm not sure you all will agree with me about this. But, you know, this, this isn't 
this is sort of in the field of character. They're often considered four domains. Um, and two are considered performance domains. You know, they are things like grit and diligence and self-regulation and perseverance. Um, it, the other is more intellectual performance. You know, it's, it's curiosity, capacity for inquiry. You know, that's an, another domain of performance. And the other two are ethical domains. You know, they're about interpersonal kindness. Are you kind? Are you caring? Do you care about your team? And the other domain is civic mindedness. Do you care about your community? Do you care about the larger world? And, you know, I think when you think about sports, it's, it's, it's helpful. It's been helpful for me to think about those four domains. Because I actually think you want to cultivate kids' capacities in all of those domains. You know, you want them to help them persevere, be more resilient, be more curious and inquiring, be learners. You want to help them be good community members, and you also want to help them, you know, work on their interpersonal kindness and their capacity for, for perspective taking and perspective coordination, coordinating the perspectives on and caring about everybody on the team individually. Um, and I think to your point, the goal is that those things shouldn't be incompatible, but that sometimes they are. And that when they are in conflict, you know, my, you probably have, can guess this, you know, my priority is that making sure kids are ethical people. So, you know, if by increasing a, a basketball player's performance means letting that player play all the time, and shoot all the time and not pass the ball. And it means that lots of kids on the bench aren't getting a chance to play. You know, that's a problem. Um, and in fact, that's an example where it might not even in, improve this person's performance in the long run because this person's performance is gonna get better if they learn how to pass the ball and they learn how to be a better teammate. But just in, in, this, in the situation with the bench, um, you know, this is complicated and it depends how old kids are and what stage of sports you're in. I'm sure you can think about this kind of thing all the time. But I think the important thing for a coach is to hold the tension, you know, that there are times where there are conflicts between performance and ethical character. And that by and large, you know, you really want to land on ethical character because in the long run, it's going to be so much more important for this person and it's going to be so much more important for our society if we make those choices. I find that really powerful. It, it's so, you know, often I think people talk about, you know, sports build character does it not. And I think you just spoke to it beautifully there of, of what kind of inherently develops a little more of that, probably that performance character than the ethical character that really, like you said, is, is lacking in society today. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, another concept that you talk about within the book, which is really, you know, was a little bit centered around parenting, though I really connected to me as a coach. And I think one of the things I struggled with as a coach was that I would claim to value certain things. I'd say, hey, I value hard work. I value selflessness. I value, you know, toughness and resiliency and kindness and care. You know, say you say you value all these things, but then again, I'm not really demonstrating them all the time myself. And I think as parents and then obviously as coaches, none of us are perfect at, at all. And that's not what we're striving for. But how do we navigate this 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 journey with our kids, you know, our, uh, and potentially our athletes, when we all oftentimes fall so short of the standard that we maybe want to hold for them or what we expect out of them? You know, I I, I think the point you're raising, I really appreciate a lot. The um, I was a you know I was a a far from perfect parent, a very flawed parent. We're all flawed parents. I don't think that our goal should be to be these, you know, living, these perfect human beings. I think it is to be living, breathing, imperfect people with our kids and, and to talk about our flaws and our weaknesses with them. And again, you know, we got to do that in a way that's appropriate given our kids' age. But, um, you know, if, if we're someone who's prone to being, competitive, biased in some way, irritable at the wrong time. Those are good things to talk to kids about and to say and to model for them how you talk about your flaws. 
um, how you talk about your negative moods, how you talk about things that you're not proud of. It's also a way you know, that they can keep you accountable, particularly as they get older, you know, that they can say, you know, dad or mom, you told me you didn't really want to be this way. And it seems to me you're being this way right now. Um, and again, depends on the kid, depends on the age. Certainly my kids are older now. They don't have any problem saying that to me. <laughs> but that's a good thing, right? Um, so I think what you want to model is not being flawless, but being able to talk about your own flaws in ways that are constructive and that really help your kids learn. And that's, those can be incredibly powerful moments, right? When we talk to our kids about our, you know, our weaknesses and things we wish we had done differently. Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate that encouragement because, you know, taking some of your advice and applying that over the last few years or the last year has been really, you know, probably one of the biggest ways that I've connected on a deeper level with my six and seven year old. Sorry to interrupt you. I mean, that's how we get close to people too, right? I mean, you know, yeah. a lot of closeness is being vulnerable and I'm not suggesting, you know, people can take this too far. Parents can talk about their feelings too much. They can be too vulnerable. Mm -hmm. They can try and be their kid's friends. All of that makes me really uncomfortable. <laughs> but um, when you make a significant mistake in front of your kids or when you're expressing something that you didn't mean to express and you think is problematic, correcting those things is really important. Right. Yeah, yeah. Me and my, my son, who's six, we, we kind of both have a bit of a short fuse and you know can get a little emotional at times. So we actually developed a secret handshake that either of us can do in those moments to support the other one if we're starting to kind of that's sense the other person's losing it. So <laughs> that's, great. that's great. Yeah. He's probably doing it to me more than I'm doing it to him, to be honest with you. So, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think one other thing I want to touch here, you know, kind of before we kind of really lock in on, on the sports aspect of things, but it's just this idea of helping our kids to find meaning and purpose. I, I feel like there's a real struggle by, you know, teenagers today and, you know, people out going out in the working place. I've seen this with some of my nieces, nephews, and, and, and other people and, you know, former athletes of just trying to find meaning and purpose in, in, in today's world. And I think we as parents are, are, are help, you know, we have some sort of responsibility in helping them to find that. And, you know, you talk extensively in the book about how, how beneficial that can be for you. And so I guess just what advice do you have for, for us as parents uh, when it comes to helping our, our kids to find meaning? You know, it, it's it's a great question. The um, in our data, our research, you know, we find a huge number of, of teens and young adults don't feel like they have meaning or purpose in their lives, and this is a big issue. And I feel like, in, you know, when you have meaning and purpose, there's a huge amount of talk, as you you know, about the teen mental health crisis in this country and in other countries. And having meaning and purpose is a really powerful antidote to to depression and anxiety too. I mean, you're, you know, there's a strong correlation between having meaning and purpose and emo emotional health and, you know, emotional well-being. Um, and, you know, I think that in, in a deep way, the most important and fundamental thing we can do with our kids is that, you know, if we find meaning in helping others and if we expect them to help others from a young age. And if that's what we express as significant, and if that's what we affirm them for, the chances are just much greater that as they get older, they're gonna have a moral identity. And by a moral identity, they're gonna have a deep commitment to caring and fairness and honesty in these values. And that when they do care for other people, they are gonna feel meaning in caring for other people. And so, you know, I think one thing we can do is uh, create in kids that moral identity so it becomes a strong source of meaning for them to be helpful to other people and to be a good teammate and, to, and these other things. Um, you know, I also think that we have to attach kids to uh, goals that are larger than themselves from a young age. That can be a school band, that can be a sport program, that can be a school play. Um, but, you know, we live in, you know, maybe the most, more psychological talk in our country right now among teens than any country in the history of humankind. I mean, there's so much focus on the self right now. Um, 
And some of that's really positive. Some of that is great. But all of us need some reprieve from our self-concerns too. And getting attached, you know, playing on a team, being on a band, being in a drum thing, being attached to things larger than yourselves can give you meaning and can get you out of yourself too, in a way that I think is really important. So, you know, there's no magic cure, but those are some of the things that can come to mind. I think the other thing I would just say quickly is I think around purpose, we often have this wrong idea that you have a single purpose. And if you burrow into yourself far enough, you can find that single purpose, your bliss, your passion, you know, that one thing. But a lot of us aren't built that way. You know, I've never been built that way. There, you know, there are a lot of things I find meaningful. I've done a lot of different things in my career. And so part of what I think you want to do is have the kind of exploratory conversations with kids that'll help them know themselves better and help them know what kinds of things are going to be meaningful for them. And it may not be one thing. It may be many things. And it may be fluid. What they find meaningful when they're 12 is going to maybe different than 15, 18, 25. And just being in conversation with them about it, too, you know, seems really important. I want to follow up on that, just the idea of finding meaning when it comes to the sports parents, because I think it can be difficult when a parent goes into, you know, we can use sports as a context here. And I think, OK, what's my role as my kids start to play more sports? And a lot of times parents would say, my job is to be supportive and to provide them with every opportunity to be successful. What that translates into oftentimes is now I need to get my kid into more training and the best club and spend the most money and travel the farthest distance so that they have every opportunity to be successful. And then I think what can be a trap for parents is that they start to identify their own success as a parent based on that child's performance. So, you know, JP and I get the opportunity every once in a while to do workshops with parents and school districts and sports parents. If we brought you in to speak to the crowd, you know, what piece of advice would you give the sports parents that are kind of trying to navigate that journey of of trying to be supportive of their child, but not get themselves wrapped up in that performance identity trap? You know, this is this is a tough one. You know, I, I and I say that as there are periods in my life as a sport parents where sport parent where I was. You know, it's an incredible rush to see your kid do well in the sport. It's, you know? And so I have a lot of empathy for parents around this. And I think you're totally right. Like, it's really important. So I think there's some red flags that parents should, should be concerned about. You know, if your partner doesn't want to sit with you in the stands because they find it embarrassing, that should be a red flag. If you're watching a basketball game outdoors and your face is pressed up against the fence while your kid is playing, or you're coaching from the stands, that should be a red flag. If you're planning all your vacations around your kid's sporting events, that should be a red flag. If all the dinner conversations are focused on sport, that should be a red flag. If your moods are regulated by how well your kid does in a, in a game, that should be a red flag. And so I think we got to, you know, I, this is a really tough problem to solve, but I think we got to Elevate those red flags. And you, I bet you have a bunch of other red flags you can think of. Give people these red flags and then give them some strategies for monitoring it. You know, like on vacation, make sure to plan. A, you know, you can plan vacations sometimes when your kid misses a, a sporting event. Don't talk about it at the dinner table. You know? <laughs> um, uh, make sure your kids are doing a variety of things, not just practicing all the time. Um, uh, you know, I, I think there's some tips like that in, in sort of at that level and just repeatedly surfacing it for parents. And like, this is what the behaviors look like. One of the things I find, I feel this is true about academic achievement pressure, sports achievement pressure, is that parents are very good at identifying other parents who they think are excessive and really bad at identifying it in themselves. <laughs> like we ask about achievement pressure we ask a question about what do you care about most, your kid's happiness, achievement, or caring for others? Most parents say what they care about most is that their care is that the kids are caring. They rank achievement very low. You ask them, what do parents in your community care about most, value most? They all say achievement. So like a large majority of parents think the problem is a large majority of other parents. 
and that doesn't square, right? So, so, you know, part of this is saying to them, it's not them, it's us, you know, it's, it's all of us like that have to work on this. Appreciate those, those red flags. Um, maybe one of those starting to notice a little bit there myself. Uh, so I gotta, you know, take notice and, and make some course corrections. <laughs> I think it's so easy. Like you said, uh, you get really excited. There's a thrill, there's a rush to see your kids do well. And, and especially too, when, when sports, especially at an early age can bring you together, right? It can basically bond you and connect you. And, and then you start to get more invested. It's an easy trap just to keep going and keep going. And, and I could see where it goes to, you know? Yeah. I just want to think about it. You know, I think one of the places that a lot of, a lot of us get as parents, I think get caught is, you know, we, we sort of vacillate. We sort of know at one level where we just say, it's just a game. Um, and, you know, in one level, it is a game, but at another level, these are games, you know, the, the anthropologist Clifford Gertz used to call it deep play, sports is deep play, because there's so much, this is why sports can build character, right? There are so much of the human drama that is played out in sports, like deep things about ourselves that are played out in sports. And so on the one hand, we should treat it as a game. On the other hand, we really got to recognize there are some deep things that are getting played out. And if we're not careful, we're going to play those things out in ways that might be harmful to our kids. Okay, some great advice there from Rick. Focus less on the self. Don't be always asking our kids, did you have fun, right? Ask about other kids in the team and how other people are doing, getting them to think more outwardly. Uh, don't be afraid to talk about winning and losing. I think this is something that we've we've talked about recently on the podcast. It's something that's you know changed to me uh, is you know not being afraid to to keep score at the younger ages. Um, I think this is really powerful. Don't praise them for doing things they are expected to do. Like don't don't use praise to regulate their their behavior. Like when they clear their plate, which is just kind of a, a basic expectation or should be one in our households. Um, we don't need to be perfect. We just need to be honest about what we are working at. Modeling, you know, this behavior or you know, modeling being able to talk about our own flaws in ways that are constructive. This this has been hugely beneficial for me as a parent. Um, I love this encouragement to affirm kids in helping others and to really try to help them set goals that are not just about themselves, but goals that are about the team or you know something bigger than themselves. Um, and lastly, those were some great common parenting traps or, or red flags that we can pay attention to. In next week's episode, we'll be talking more in depth about how we as coaches can further develop our athlete's character. All right, that's it for today's episode of the Coaching Culture Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, we're grateful for people who take 15 to 30 seconds just to leave us a review. And I know your friends appreciate it when you send them an episode that they find valuable. So don't hesitate to share today's episode.